Hey everyone, so I hate when I promise you guys content and then I don't come through on time, but looks like I'm going to be postponing that mini documentary on docetism I've been working on yet again. I just saw so many stories that I really wanted to cover pop up this week, and it was unbelievable. There was the Catholic school Harry Potter ban, the woman who refused to marry an interracial couple, supposedly because of her Christian beliefs, and then this one I'm going to cover now. And this one involves Tucker Carlson. And I was about to say that if I had enough time, maybe I'd try to make video slash audio episodes on the other two stories as well. But maybe instead I'll just try to give a brief synopsis or rundown of each before moving on to this episode's main story. So by now most of you have probably heard that story about a Catholic school that banned the Harry Potter books from their library because they supposedly contain real uh, spells and curses. I was about to dig into that docetism episode and then I heard that. And as a non-believer, the story was so laughably absurd, I was like, how can I not cover it? And there's been an update to the story. It seems a number of complaints have come to light regarding the priest behind the ban. And I'm pretty much forced to listen to the local news all day at work, and I was surprised by how much coverage the story was getting. I couldn't find an audio clip from the news station in question, but here's an article from their online site. And so this is from WHDH.com. Parents complained of priests who banned Harry Potter books. Nashville, Tennessee Associated Press. A Tennessee priest who banned Harry Potter books from a Catholic school's library was accused by parents of causing their children psychological and spiritual harm. The Tennessean obtained a 2017 letter from 14 St. Edward Catholic school parents urging the Nashville Diocese to remove the Reverend Dan Rehill, I think it is. The letter with 50 bullet points said Rehill is a toxic narcissist who hates Pope Francis and views himself as a quote-unquote soldier of God. It said our school, however, consists of children, not soldiers. Diocesan spokesman Rick Masaccio said Rehill's views, like that of the retired, more liberal pastor he replaced, both have homes in the church. Rehill didn't respond to the newspaper's interview request. In an email, he said he removed J.K. Rowling's books because they contain actual spells and curses. 2019, and there's still people who are caught up in that superstitious kind of thinking. Whew. Okay, so then we have this brief clip of a woman, as I mentioned before, who refuses to marry an interracial couple, citing her religious beliefs. First of all, we don't do gay weddings or mixed race. Okay, so why not? Because of our Christian race. I mean, our Christian belief. Okay, we're Christians as well, so yes, what, what in the Bible tells you that? Well, I don't want to argue my faith. No, that's fine. We just, that's yeah, we just, we just don't participate. Okay. We just choose not to. Okay. So that's your Christian belief, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I apologize for the audio quality there. Uh, I believe it was recorded on a cell phone or something like that. So I have to admit, the first time I heard this clip, I missed the part where she mentions her opposition to gay marriage right before she mentions her opposition to interracial marriage. Maybe you can make an argument that the Bible is against gay marriage due to its clear description of marriage as being between a man and a woman. Not that I care. I'm a secular person who strongly supports gay marriage, LGBT rights, and who thinks that marriage in general is a man-made institution. But yeah, just keeping it real, if you're a Christian, you probably could find some scriptural footing for an argument against gay marriage, but interracial marriage? Am I missing something? What the heck does the Bible have to say about it? If anything, aren't there stories about Israelite kings and prominent biblical figures marrying people from foreign lands, etc.? Actually, here's a little excerpt I grabbed from a Christian site called... Uh, Legionnaire Ministries or something like that. And so here the author of the article is responding to a question about this very thing. And they say, I think one of the strongest texts that does relate to this is in the Old Testament. 
where we read that Moses, who was the mediator of the Old Covenant, took to himself a wife who was a Cushite. A Cushite was an Ethiopian. All of the evidence that we can construct on Old Testament history indicates that Moses' wife was black. We also read that his sister, Miriam, became very distressed by the fact that her brother married a Cushite. It was a racist reaction. Miriam got angry and rebuked Moses. Because of Miriam's response, God, ju uh, God judged Miriam and gave her leprosy. So if anything, it would seem to me that God frowns upon those who are racist. The plural form of racist is hard to say. It's, it's hard to get that T down between the two S's. Anyway, let's finally move on to that Tucker story. I found a Young Turks clip in my suggested video feed, and it features Tucker Carlson, Carlson's kind of hard to say tonight too, trying to pull a gotcha on a politically left-leaning guest. And I couldn't believe how petty, juvenile, and wrong-headed Carlson seems. I'm not going to play the whole thing, just the bit with Tucker in it, and then I'll add my two cents, but you will hear Anna Kasparian at the beginning. Tucker Carlson is dumb, and if you don't believe me, just watch this next clip and it'll prove it. If we had less access to guns, less access to ammunitions, the suicide rate would plummet, and the number of gun deaths, which are now at 33,000 per year, would, would decrease. I mean, 93 people are killed every single day by guns. Seven kids are killed every day. Are you against suicide now? 50 women are killed every month really? by I their partners. Because I thought the left supported a suicide. Because last time I checked, like in the state of Maine, for example, the left has now made physician-assisted suicide legal. The left pushed that. I'm opposed to I, it. But so, how, so you for or against suicide? I'm kind of losing track on this I, question. I personally am against suicide but I think oh. physician-assisted suicide is something that should be between the doctor oh, and the patient. Oh, but you shouldn't be Blow allowed your to do it gun, yourself. Oh, I get it. You gotta take my guns away because of suicide, but meanwhile, you're making suicide legal. But to be clear, Tucker, I'm I don't sorry, wanna take the your BS guns is away. Just too much. So suicide by guns is different from physician-assisted suicides. Uh, this is why I say that Tucker Carlson is dumb because he is equating two completely different things. And so, yeah, I agree with Anna there. And so firstly, there's this grotesque cartoonish generalization or mischaracterization that the left as a whole support suicide. And once again, as I've said on the show ad nauseum, I consider myself a left-leaning independent. My political views definitely align with the left, but I do my best to avoid groupthink and I don't openly affiliate myself with any particular political party. Uh, but anyway, this gross mischaracterization by Tucker is wrong on so many levels. There's a big difference between medically assisted suicide or euthanasia and suicide by gun. As Anna will go on to say, there's about eight states that allow medically assisted suicide. And I think in the case of, uh, was it Maine or Vermont, uh, at least, it, it requires that the individual in question be terminally ill. So big difference between, say, perhaps an elderly person who's at the end of the line, maybe terminally ill or in unbearable pain, or maybe even a younger person who's terminally ill with some kind of inoperable cancer or something and in extreme physical suffering. A big difference between that, as sad as those cases are, and say someone who could probably otherwise be helped with therapy or medication, blowing their brains out with a gun because in that moment they feel lost in despair. And I was recently talking about guns on the show and saying how personally I'm not really interested in guns outside of, say, shooting zombies in a Resident Evil game. And I don't own a gun. I feel very self-conscious talking about this. But I have to admit that one reason why I feel uncomfortable owning a gun is that I wrestle with depression and at times also chronic pain. And I don't think... I would ever take my own life, but having an implement around the house that would allow me to quickly do so with the pull of a trigger doesn't really seem like a good idea. But yeah, there's this characterization that people on the left don't value human life. And this might be presumptuous, but I imagine the majority of people on the left, like myself, probably see it the way I do, that suicide is a very serious matter and it's something we should fight to prevent. But euthanasia or medically assisted suicide, as sad as it is, should probably be permitted, uh, especially in extreme cases where someone is terminally ill and in unbearable physical pain or suffering. But Tucker Carlson is painting it like lefties don't value life and are pro-suicide. 
that they shouldn't care, according to their own ideology, about the disturbing idea of an otherwise healthy person ending their life with a gun. And I should mention in fairness that I believe there have been at least a couple of cases overseas, maybe in the Netherlands or some Scandinavian country, I forget exactly, where the courts have ruled in favor of allowing a young person suffering from depression to go through with medically assisted suicide. And I'll read a bit from this article from The Atlantic. How Dutch law got a little too comfortable with euthanasia. The story of a 17-year-old's assisted death wasn't real, but it could have been. And this is dated June 8th, 2019, so not too long ago. However alarmist some stories about Noah Pothoven's death might have been, one should remember that euthanasia of a minor as young as 16 for psychiatric suffering is indeed legal in the Netherlands. Pothoven, and I really hope I'm getting her name correct, uh, a 17-year-old girl in that country had struggled with depression, anorexia, and post-traumatic stress disorder, reportedly after being sexually abused at age 11 and, uh, this is rough, raped at 14. She had sought permission for medical euthanasia and announced on Instagram that she intended to die. Her passing on June 3rd prompted news stories around the world, their dramatic headlines and implicit rebuke of Dutch-assisted death policies. In most countries, the debate over physician-assisted suicide has centered on adults in the final stages of incurable physical illness. Pothoven's age and mental illness made her case quite different, which is why the initial English-language news stories on her death sparked such alarm. That uproar subsided when subsequent reports clarified that Pothoven's euthanasia request had been turned down and that she had instead died by refusing to eat and drink. The sad outcome does not, however, show that all is well with the Dutch approach to assisted death, or that fears of a slippery slope are merely alarmist. And uh, it goes on to say, a respected Dutch-language medical journal recently reported that 18-year-old had died via medically-assisted suicide for psychiatric problems. So whether any of these reports' stories are actually true or not, uh, that's too far for me, despite or because of my sympathy for people wrestling with severe depression. I'm very disturbed by the idea of euthanasia for people suffering from mood disorders, especially young people with their whole lives ahead of them. I don't care if you have to spend every day on a ketamine drip. You know, keep trying different antidepressant medications, undergo extensive talk therapy. I know psychological and or emotional suffering can be very acute and it might seem like there's no hope or no way out. You know, but don't give up, as cliche as that sounds. In fact, one of the common symptoms of depression can be the feeling that there's no hope or that things will never get better. But with time and or with the right treatment, uh, those feelings can and probably will pass. They might come back again, but it helps to remember that they're temporary and that even if it doesn't seem like it, you can get through it. Uh, this too shall pass, as they say. And I don't mean to, you know, come off as glib or too rosy about this, because I know some depression can be very treatment resistant. But I think, you know, you just have to keep trying to fight. And if you're, uh, you know, the, the family member or the spouse of someone who's wrestling with severe depression is frustrating as it might seem and as much of an uphill battle as it might seem, you know, keep fighting and trying to remind them that even if it doesn't seem like it, they can get through it somehow. And I remember my friend Crocoduck, who I always mention on the show, not to be confused with the popular atheist YouTuber King Crocoduck, uh, we had a disagreement some time ago when I mentioned my opposition to medically assisted suicide for people suffering from depression on the show. And this was a couple of years ago at least, so there was one of those cases in the news back then about someone in the Netherlands or overseas somewhere, a, a young girl, I believe it was, petitioning the court for the right to be euthanized because she was suffering from, you know, severe depression. And I've actually been thinking about Crocoduck lately. He hasn't been active on Twitter for, uh, I think, at least two or three weeks or something. I hope everything's all right with him. Uh, hopefully he'll get in touch uh, eventually. Hopefully. 
But with that being said, I'll call this episode a wrap. You guys know the drill. You can like the Facebook page, follow the show on Twitter, can check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that now. And uh, of course, if you want to help support the show monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash the weekend out and help the show out for as little as 99 cents a month. And, you know, I am trying to hopefully someday, you know, turn this into my day job, still swinging a hammer all week. Uh, I'd be able to produce a lot more content and really throw myself into the show more if, uh, you know, this, if I could afford to make this my day job. But anyways, thanks for listening. And uh, until next week, brothers and sisters, and uh, Crocoduck, if you're out there, man, get in touch with me.